Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Shmuel Peleg here, even though I know you all know him. Uh, Shmuel uh, graduated from uh, Maryland with uh, uh, Rosenfeld a while ago, and uh, a few, quite a few years later he sent me there to do a PhD. Uh, after, you know, we never really wrote papers together, right? But uh, it was a pleasure to be there. And yeah, and he's going to talk about non-chronological -chron time in video editing. And I think it's going to show us some uh, cool recent results. Okay. Thank you, Yoni. Uh, this is the title of my talk in the last couple of years, always different content, because uh, most of the things I do, I, I play with time in video. And uh, actually, or originally, I was uh, think, uh, thinking to show you only uh, a summarization of, of video and webcams, but Actually, last couple of weeks we had new result in mosaicing, so I'll push this them in at the end. Okay, so in order to see if what we are doing is relevant, we are always asking ourselves, what is the relevant, what is most popular video? We want what we do to be applicable to video, and so we want to be applicable to video. So we ask, what's the most popular video camera? Well, this is simple. This is the most popular video camera. We have it in every pocket. But uh, the trouble is that it is rarely used. So there's no video, basically, very little video cap captured with these video cameras. Then the question is, what is the most popular video that is being captured? Well, the most popular video that is being captured uh, comes from this camera. They go, there are millions of them around. They work seven uh, days a week, 24 hours a day. The trouble with this video is that no one watches the video. There's a tons of video, no one can watch. Only in London, there's four and a half million cameras. How many people are needed to watch four and a half million cameras 24 hours a day? So, uh, uh, so the question is, okay, so what is more popular video watched? So I don't know, maybe people in Google or Microsoft Search or whatever can tell us, I, I don't know. This. So uh, out of these, the first type of work I'll be describing it will be relevant to this surveillance camera. So we see these uh, uh, surveillance cameras, they uh, transmit video all the time. Most of the time this is boring, irrelevant. Can we look at a week's worth of video in a minute, in an hour? Uh, so this is this address. Uh, and the second thing, uh, mosaicing, etc., is basically trying to make these portable cameras more, more useful. Uh, so, so this is a sample of, of the webcam. There is online, on the web, tens of thousands of cameras that you can access. This is an example of, of a camera video we captured it's at Stuttgart Airport. Uh, if you look at this, you can understand why no one is watching, because very boring. It is active. You see uh, planes, will, buses coming and going, but very slowly. Or This is a webcam of a billiard club. Slightly fast forward because it's boring regularly. And again, one person is playing. You start to wonder, why do they need all this table if only one person is doing? But then what happened in this club in general? You go there and so what happened there in, in general, in a day, in a week? And this is what we will be ad addressing. So, so basically what we try to do is we try to uh, collect activities in monitors where it comes. And then serve queries, query like show me in one minute what happened in the last two hours, or show me in 15 minutes the last two weeks. Now we can always do fast forward, but if we take a fast forward of two hours into one minute, or two weeks in 15 minutes, we won't see anything. So we'd like to do this in a, a more elegant way, and, and actually here uh, we use uh, uh, something that uh, we initially develop for a finite video. So what we do in a finite video, we have a finite video, we have activities, uh, and the activities occur at different time. We just push activities that occur at different time to occur together. And uh, uh, 
so if each activity activity is mean moving object basically so over activity so in inside the scene it's a stationary camera stationary background the only activity is moving object so there's a trajectories in space and in time we just move them into a shorter video and and play them well I'll just skip this. Um, tons of work, only in CVPR last week, there's maybe a dozen papers about how to track object and segment them with motion. So many of things to do this. We did the most stupid thing, so uh, it's not worth talking about it. So if we have a, a video like that, uh, which is kind of three activities happening uh, one after the other, this is the space-time representation. Someone comes to the left, some for the right, someone again from the left. If we move their activities to happen concurrently, we just push them in time to a more compact time. We get this space-time volume. This red line is basically the new video. And, and basically, this thing will happen concurrently in a much shorter time. We see all activities in a much shorter time. We lose the chrono chronological order, but we see all activities. So, so what they describe is this different object occur in different times, we push them into a shorter period. What happens is one object appears all the time. Now, if this one object appears all the time and, and our short video is uh, short enough to accommodate the object, that's fine. But if our short video is shorter than the duration of the object, assume it, it is one third the direction of the object, so we break the object into part of shorter parts and basically repack them in time. So this is an example on uh, Lena, the daughter of Michael Cohen. Uh, thanks for the video. So she is on the monkey bars here. Long video. We want to make it shorter. We take her trajectory, break it into three. Everything is done automatically. The segmentation, the breaking, the packing. And this is the shorter uh, video. Again, this works also with mosaicing. Uh, the background is summarized actually by, by mosaicing, and then the object over the, the background is done in a stroboscopic way. Uh, so the, the Linus, what happened is that the camera was tracking the, the object, and uh, the object was broken into part, and a new panoramic video was shorter and showed different instances of the object. Originally they happened at a different time, but they show concurrently to, in order to shorten the time. So now we walk on, go back to the webcam. So we have this webcam that transmits in infinite video, never ends. Uh, so what we do, we take online the video, and as we record the video, we find in our case, moving object, we track them and we keep them in a database. So we have a database of moving object, we store them. While we do this, we compute some features. If the object is an area of, with a lot of uh, collisions with others, we need this for the picking later. Some other features, size, duration, etc. If the database is full and because the video is infinite, eventually the database will fill up, we start to throw away objects. We uh, played with several uh, methods of throwing away objects from the database. The one I like best is a random selection. Just pick an object or activity at random and throw it away. What would the, this would do? This will basically is reduce exponentially uh, the distribution of object in time. So the older you are, the more a uh, deletion cycle you went to, the lower your probability to stay, and the newer object have higher probability to stay. So. Just random deletion of object is very close to optimal. And then come, come, comes a query. Query says, give me the last day in 10 seconds. So we collect all the objects of the last 24 hours, uh, and we try to pick them into 10 seconds. Uh, so in order to pick them, uh, probably our compression in time will be so large so we won't be able to do all the objects so we have to decide which object to show or not so we use some of the for example object that appear on a very assume there is a road that everyone goes on the road so probably we have to select few objects on the road but if there is a lawn outside that only Israelis cross the lawn diagonally 
then uh, we'll pick all them because uh, the space is free. <coughs> and then we generate the output. Here we, the idea was the stitching because we take different objects from different times, stitch them together, different lighting condition, uh, we stitch together. We have one object which is special object, this is a background. The background object we treat in a different way. We just do a stroposcopic uh, uh, view of, of the background on top of which we show the object. So if we take this uh, Stuttgart Eber example, and we want to see, well, there must be some activity. Planes must be landing, taking off. If we wait for a plane to land or take off, we will make, spend many minutes. Can we see this in a few seconds? And, and here the activity in uh, 20 seconds. Uh, so, so we see that I, I guess pretty, pretty much of the uh, takeoff and departure may have been uh, captured here. Uh, and we see that we see a lot of activities, much were thrown away, and, and, and much is uh, shown as well. The background, you can see the uh, uh, stroboscopic, uh, not the stroboscopic, the background is fast forward. Plate, so we can see the day, day night coming day. Uh, we, you can notice that we put uh, cars from the night into the day, so you see car driving with headlights in the day. So, in order for smoothing, we did kind of stitching tricks, and and with this, uh, it's easier with the uh, billiard club. Notice the billiard has no pockets, so uh, it's the first time I've seen this. But people tell me it's it's the real billiard with no pockets. Uh, and and then uh, I don't know where where this is, uh, probably not in Israeli time zone. But when I came the next morning and look at the summary in ten seconds of the the night, uh, then we see this all the activity uh, collected uh, together. So we see eventually the place is busy and has people, even though we have no idea whether the people are concurrently or maybe each time there's one play and other desk. Now each object has has a tag, you know where it is coming, what time it's coming. So, so I can basically kick, click on an object and, and learn when it is. If I recorded the video, I can even go back to the video and play it back. So we had fun doing it. Uh, and then comes, well, can we do it smarter? The idea is, OK, we can do smarter. Because rather than taking the background separately and the object separately and stitching them together, when we do the stitching, we can take the object together. We, we can background and stitch. Uh, using usually graph cuts to minimize the stitching cost. So we want the space and time environment of the object in the video will be similar to the space and time environment in the output uh, synopsis. Uh, we don't have enough computer power to run this optimization, so we just left it in this uh, slide. Uh, so one of the things we asked ourselves, what is good for? So it's, it's, it was fun doing this and we fun looking at these pictures. But is it of any use? So uh, my idea of use of this thing maybe is to go to places like Virtual Earth to take all these webcams that are around, uh, thousands of them, and basically plant them in Virtual Earth. So uh, when you look around in New York, you'll see, oh, there's a camera there. So you can see the camera live. Usually the camera live will not show much because Maybe Times Square. There's one couple of cameras in Times Square that are busy all the time. But uh, other than Times Square cameras, then you can say, well, not only look, see the place live, but see the place like what happened in this place in the last couple of hours, in the last couple of days. So you can have this uh, summary. OK, now I'll go back in time into what uh, basically we started in this uh, uh, Place uh, playing in time. So we started in, in, in mosaicing. Uh, so, so I gave a similar talk here, I think, about two years ago. So I'll go with this quickly. Uh, so the idea was to take a, a video and do a mosaic, and no problem, everyone knows how to do this. But then what we're missing in the mosaic is the wind, and we like to put the wind also in the mosaic. And again, there's a temporal issue. We look at the shadow here, and we look at the branch that casts the shadow. Now we see them simultaneously. But in the original video, they were taken a few seconds apart. So we have to shift activities, shift objects in time, in order to be able to generate such a dynamic mosaic 
when we capture a dynamic scene. Uh, so the way we do this is first we uh, align the video in what we call uh, align space to volume. We may talk about alignment uh, later. And, uh, and then uh, uh, we, well I, I explain here what's alignment, so I'll skip this. And uh, we run a surface through this volume and all the pixels that intersect, or all the pixels that are closer intersecting this uh, surface will be displayed as an image. So if you want to create a new video, we move the surface and this will be the, the next image. We'll create a video out of, out of uh, space-time volume by running a surface through it. Uh, and uh, the example is kind of we evolve, e evolve the surface and basically we collect all the pixels and display them. Actually, we can apply also special transformation like magnification or reduction, which I will not talk about now. And we can do, uh, get funny things like this. This is the uh, demolition of the kingdom here. Uh, remember what time what did it happen? 2000? Hmm? And uh, so the company that does demolition has on the website the, uh, the video. And if you want the video to happen differently, like the top to collapse first or the sides, the structure was gone. But if you build the space and volume and the run surface, that the center is from the future, this is a time axis, and the sides are from the past, so you run this surface through the space time volume, you get a new video that the center collapses first. Or if you run another surface that the sides are from the future and the center from the past through the space time volume, you get a new video where the sides collapse first and the center collapse later. Now, there's this methods of, of running has all these interpolation stitching issues. Uh, well, unfortunately, it did not happen here because everything is texture, all the background texture, so we don't, we're not cutting in the middle of object, but uh, uh, we can overcome this with uh, uh, mean cut issues. Okay, we can uh, do more interesting thing with uh, running the space time, uh, uh, running this uh, time manifold. For example, we can look at the uh, object moving, we decide we want to accelerate or slow down object. In our case we want to select who is the winner so we take uh, initial time, everyone starts, this is space time volume, this is time and for one swimmer we take the final uh, time so that he finishes when everything goes in the last frame he will be taking from the future compared to all the others. So we run a space time uh, the uh, time front, we run it equal speed except that the time goes faster for the swimmer and he'll win. So his time is going faster and if his friend is envy, you, know, you want to win as well, well we can do the same thing for the friend, let the friend's time run faster. And now someone else can win. So it's very easy, it's, it is as simple as it looks, it's uh, very simple. Uh, we sent it to Seagraph, the reviewer we rejected, at least one of the reviews said we must reject it because it's so simple, every high school kid can do that. And the answer is true, every high school kid can do that. Okay, so we'll uh, uh, continue with mosaicing. How we do the mosaicing that's dynamics? We scan the scene, we build this aligned space and volume. The space time volume is diagonal because the camera is scanning the scene, so we have a special translation and we create a mosaic by running this surface. This surface going the basically mosaic of the right side of the images. So we see this mosaic, we run the surface in the positive time axis and the water flows down and we get both panorama and the water that flows down. We've never seen the water on the right and the water on the left together like we see in the mosaic. What we see the the angle here of the uh, time front basically converted time into space. So it takes things that happen in the future and put them on the left. So basically it's, it's the angle, rotation of the angle basically, it's, it's made like how do we convert time into space. And this is another use of uh, all these cameras that we hold in our pocket. We go on a trip, we scan around, and we can do that. Uh, so once we have this, every trip I take, I, 
like the kind of dynamic panoramas and uh, and do this. Uh, interesting trick is we said the angle convert uh, space into time. Uh, so particular angles have different effects. So for example, if we take this angle of this uh, time front and we just run it on a positive time axis. Notice originally that we've took the falls from left to right. Now we take this time front and this is the output image, the intersection. So get this output frame. We run the time front in the positive time and the frame go to the left. So we started with the video going from right to left. We ended with the video going from left to right. So this original video, sorry, left to right, and we want to do right to left. The natural way is just to play it backward from the last frame to the first frame, and then we see that water goes, flows up. But when we do in our way, we get right to left, and the water continues flowing down. So it is something very unintuitive. So we reverse the time for the camera, but we do not reverse the time for the drops. Uh, and this all depends on this angle. So the techno technique is very trivial. Basically, be the space-time volume and just run a surface. But very unintuitive things can be done with this uh, trivial technique. Shmuel, yeah. Do you get foreshortening effects? Like in that Thessaloniki thing, the people look a little skinny. Do you keep the things get compressed? Especially? That's a Doppler effect, yeah. OK. So if, you, if there's a scanning camera and you walk together with the camera, you'll uh, get uh, thicker. If you walk on the opposite direction, then you'll get, uh, th it's, it's a fast way to do diet. Just walk in the other direction. And again, this thing can be overcome. It, when it's textured, you don't feel it. When you don't want this to happen, you need to use better stitching methods like uh, graph cuts, etc. So, uh, uh, OK. Uh, now, I, one thing I want to mention additionally is the uh, directionality of the rays. And, and uh, you know, everyone here knows image-based rendering and the Lumigraph. And uh, this is a primitive thing. So it, it says that, you know, like if you take columns on, on, the, on, the, on the image, a column from the side will be a ray looking on sideways, and column from the center, a ray looking uh, up front. And, and if we have a camera that is translating, we'll take... Uh, uh, if we take a panorama from inside the column, will be push broom. If we take from the side, we also get push broom, but looking a different direction. And uh, and basically, if we take the space and volume and and we run uh, the uh, time front from left to right, we'll get this uh, we'll get this uh, this effect of uh, this original video. And this is running left to right. So we get the stereo effect, or I get the supply of video helicopter from Japan. So this is why I, all the helicopters video I use from Japan. Or if you go to a trip in Israel, this is a nice place, ancient place in Israel, Kesaria. And you can see it in Panorama 3D. Let's skip that. OK, but the more interesting thing is what happens if you don't rotate if you don't slide this, but if you rotate, if you rotate the uh, uh, the slice, what do you get? So every slice in the space of volume is a panorama. And when you rotate it, you get another panorama. So what is the effect that you get? And the effect that you, you actually get is, is moving forward and backward. Very, again, one of this unintuitive stuff, you take something, you rotate in space and volume, and move forward and backward. And uh, I'll, I'll go quickly over this. So we have a translating camera. This is the field of view on the left, and this is the, the images. And uh, see so what is a diagonal, uh, a diagonal slice? We take the left slice, the left uh, column from the left image, and as we go in the video to the right, we move as well the slice to the right. So we start from the left column of the left image, and we end up with the right column of the right image. And we get a set of rays, uh, and if we continue them, they intersect uh, somewhere in the back. So we have all the rays passing through the camera path and passing through a vertical line on the back, basically simulating uh, a virtual camera that has this feature. All rays go through a horizontal line. This is the camera path. And all rays through a vertical line. This is a vertical line. It's a virtual line that's called by the stitching. 
when the black and uh, blue walls touch each other, we get the pinhole camera, but otherwise we have what we call a cross-lit camera. And we can get the fact that uh, uh, moving forward, it's, so if we just rotate the slice, we get the moving forward effect. So it's, it's not a full image-based rendering because we have the 3D effect only in the rays that turn left and right, no up and down. So up and down, it's only scaling. Left and right is, is really a 3D effect, and we can see the object coming out of hiding behind this table, and there's parallax effect. So all the effect here is just taking rotating the stuff. So we get single curve of uh, distortions. Well, okay, so what's interesting, we'll talk about this as well. What's interesting about the crosslet, it's not perspective, it's not full IDR. So when we try to make the distance between the horizontal and vertical too far, we start to get distorted object. It's even more distorted if, since the vertical state is virtual, we can move it actually behind the object. So then say, how does the object look when it photographs from behind? So object will open up. It will look very, very distorted when it photographs from, from behind. So, so once doing cross lit if distortion is official, one should be careful and not uh, to overdo this uh, distortion. And, uh, and now it's, the thing is, uh, how do you do use it in mosaicing of very, very long scenes? So uh, we're driving around in Jerusalem in uh, taking our uh, tiny camera in the street. And this street, until our actual memory card filled up, so it's about half a kilometer, 2,000 frames, and uh, we stop. So, uh, so what we want to do, we want to take this video that's available everywhere. We want to compute the camera motion. Actually, by the way, we also computed the depth. And we create a mosaic of this very, very long route. Uh, actually, we thought about this <laughs> when both Google and uh, Microsoft started to issue views from the street. And the trouble was they used special equipment, special trucks, uh, special acquisition. And then you realize they're working about for years before anything was released because it takes time to drive trucks through the cities and takes a long time to cover the universe. It's, it's not like satellite photography that you cover the universe very fast. We thought, can, why not let the user upload? Everyone has a camera. Everyone has a car. He can drive in his block and upload his block when he does upload this block, he can kind of click, go to virtual earth, click on the, the street. I started at this point, started at that point, and looked to this direction. You do, you stitch the images on this and put it on the web. If you are afraid that you will be liable, you can put it. I didn't take this picture. He did, he did it. Uh, usually I know that Google has issues with privacy. They uh, blur all the faces of the people they took. But they do it only on the picture they took. They don't do it on YouTube. If you upload a video to YouTube, no face is being blurred. So the same thing, if you upload the video, you don't need to blur anything because it's he did it, not you. So, uh, so the question, what does it involve to be able to take this video from anyone for this type of video and, and create a long panorama out of it? So basically, this is the very long half a kilometer panorama. And it needs two things. One is to compute the motion of the camera, not the image. And another thing is to, to stitch it. Now, we play with all these uh, ego motion, even our own ego motion algorithm that we did before, and they all failed. They failed some after 10 frames, some after 100 frames, some 500 frames. But no ego motion could really sustain all the real uh, length of the video and the uh, variety and the depth difference that we had there. So we turn to what we know is best. What, the, what worked all the time for us was look two-dimensional Lucas Canada image alignment. This always works. It's direct method, uses all pixels, doesn't need to find feature points, works in low contrast, high contrast, noise, no, no. So, so can we use this to do our ego motion? And we tried this method that proves very, very uh, efficient. So 
what we do, we do, we iterate between two-dimensional Lucas Canada and stereo. Now we use here graph cut stereo because just a, a new method, so we played with that. But I believe that other methods could be used. And, and we just iterate between 2D Lucas Canade and stereo and, and, and the method, basically most of the computation is in 2D. 2D warping, 2D uh, alignment, and just skip the detail. And, and we kind of very quickly uh, got to, uh, in, like even in a scene like that, if just we do just motion computation in stereo, we got this type of scene, the, the red one as the one that couldn't find any reasonable match. After one iteration, the second iteration, we get almost most of the thing, third iteration is complete. So very quickly we do, uh, we find the motion of the camera. And by the way, we get the scene depth. Our goal was not to get the scene depth. We were surprised that we get such a wonderful scene depth. And maybe this is because of the uh, graph cut stereo that we used. Uh, but we actually don't need this accurate scene depth to, to compute robust motion, but, uh, yeah. Isn't there an ambiguity between the depth and the translation? In other words, for different translations, there are different equivalent depth maps. There's one number, yeah. One free parameter. Uh -huh. So it, it's relative. Right. But you so. don't care. It's everything, there is a constant there. Right. It's what you get is disparity, which is uh, motion divided by depth. Right, but you're you're doing. There's a global component that is your Lucas Canade sideways translation measured in pixels, and then there is your depth map. I, right? I measure everything in pixels. Right. Okay. So you have. So it's you not metric. Okay, if you ask, is it metric? No, it's not. No, no, I'm not asking that. I could basically, if, if that disparity map is interpreted as horizontal pixels away from the dominant translation, right? I could add a particular value to the whole depth map and subtract that same value to the translation and get an equivalent. No, no, solution. you can multiply and divide, not add. Well, again, it depends if you're doing it in pixels or not. We'll, we'll talk about okay. it. Okay. So, uh, so it was surprisingly works surprisingly well uh, and actually d doesn't fail. We used all our tricks. We the paper is online, so I, I don't want to go to the details. And, and, and then, so what, once this is done, we can walk cross lit. So how do we do walk cross lit? Of course, we can go sideways, no problem. But we can go inside. Now, you can see the distortions, uh, but you can see the effect of walking uh, inside into the side streets. You can see the cars that are hidden and the car behind them. So you can walk in inside or you can take kind of visual trips that that we do, and uh, all these effects that can be done with uh, different uh, passing of the slice of the space-time volume. Now, one of the tricks is, is we want to do a very long mosaic. And a very long mosaic, if we do cross lit or push or whatever, we get distortion. Because very long, eventually it turns into push broom, and push broom has distortion. What does it mean? Distortion, the parallel, the rays are parallel, it's like looking from infinity. We don't have the vertical line or horizontal, so we cannot do full uh, two-dimensional uh, light field. So we get objects that are far away. We get very wide objects that are close. We get very narrow. Uh, so the trick is to use different projections for different uh, scene patterns. Uh, the initial approach was uh, proposed in, in this paper. Uh, what the approach was as following. Let's take the pattern, arbitrarily break it into segments. Uh, and once you arbitrarily break it into segments, uh, in each segment, compute which cross-lit image is most appropriate for this. For example, if the scene <coughs> does not have any depth, if we say that all the scene has the same depth, there is n any projection on Earth will not give any distortion. So we can put the cross lit behind the scene in front of this, it doesn't matter. If the scene is equal depth, so this is where we can compensate. If the scene has a lot of depth variety, like I'm looking here, there's a seat close by, a seat far away, there's only one projection, there'll be no distortion. And that's the regular perspective projection. So, so what they did here, they played between a perspective, distortion, weather, depth difference, in this case is the trees, 
and the building, so there's depth differences, so the, the perspective, and in between there were many flat walls. They took actually a projection with the, a negative kind of, they put the camera behind the scene, so, and they did it in a way that is smooth, and that was kind of complicated, uh, complicated uh, optimization step. Uh, basically, that was a cross slit that the vertical slit was one time perspective and behind the scene, perspective behind the scene. And usually it was behind the scene when uh, uh, things were flat. But the question is how to put the division into segments and how to, was not that uh, simple. Uh, so basically if we look at the space-time volume, what we see is that we get the scene and, and we get the curve. This is one cross slit represent one segment, another cross slit represent another segment, etc. So we get this type of, of curve through this uh, space-time volume. But when you look at this curve, and then we ask ourselves, why do we need straight slices? Why not have a continuous slices? And actually, to get these straight slices is, is basically a very complicated uh, knapsack problem how to do this. This is trivial to do a continuous one. This is trivial in uh, dynamic programming. So it's dynamic programming. You need to do two segments. You don't. Basically, this is the limit of give me an infinite number of segments and try infinite number of things. So, uh, a similar work was done by Yoni, uh, but Yoni didn't take into account the distortion. So we took basically the work that was done in Stanford and the work we did by Yoni and we should put them together. And so we got the, the cost for the number probably will have two elements. One element will be the stitching cost. So we get a nice stitch panorama, and this is the cost Yoni used. And another cost is the cost for distortion. We don't want distortion. If we have a lot of uh, depth differences, we'd like to use something close to perspective. If the scene is flat, we don't care. We can use anything. Uh, and then we've got this path, and we get a non-distorted uh, uh, image. Non-distorted locally. We see globally it does have its distortion, locally it's non distorted. Now, just about uh, a technical thing about stitching, uh, when we stitch, when you're moving camera and we have parallax, we cannot take rectangular strip and stitch them together because a far away object moves slower and closer away and, and we have multiplication. So everyone did mosaicing knows that. So we need to compensate for, for depth. And basically, this happens when you don't compensate for depth. So we get multiplication of the background and uh, some section are missing in the foreground. When you do compensate, it, it is smooth. Uh, so, so what we had the mosaicing cost for the strip, we'll have two components. One is the stitching cost. Make sure that the pixels after the strip that we stitched in the image are similar to the pixel after the strip we stitched in the original image. So this is one cost. Another cost is the distortion. Now, we found out that the best way, the best measure for distortion, just the variance of disparities. We look at the strip. We have the disparity of the pixel in the strip. Just take the variance of disparity. So basically, this is our use of depth in our model is only for these two costs. It's is for warping the strips and for var computing the variance of, of disparity. So maybe we use the depth in a statistical way. We don't use the depth as if we have a 3D model and then we navigate in a 3D model. We only use it statistically. So when you use statistical depth rather than depth, we can have mistakes. So we don't need a very accurate depth here. So, uh, so we build a, a graph. Uh, these are images and this is the left strip of the, of the left column of every strip in every image and the cost if, if in one frame we have the left column in the strip in image R in column I and then column J, we compute the cost and then just compute the minimal path using dynamic programming and this is what we get. So we can put push room, the, so this is the, on top of this push room mosaicing, you can see that cars that are far away are widened and this door that's close uh, is uh, narrow, you can think who can go through this door. And using our, we call it minimum aspect distortion mosaicing, med mosaicing. Using med mosaicing, we get this panorama which has the right uh, 
flavor both for the car in the background and for the object in the foreground. We even get the benefit of moving objects. So for example, we were the street people walking the street. Uh, if we just do regular stitching, we get uh, people truncated. In this case, the stitching cost uh, caused the people uh, uh, to come out. This is the width of the strip. So we see when there's this, so we get the white strip on this person, the white strip on this. So we didn't actually need to do a graph cut to actually detect the person, cut it out, and paste it again. We just, by playing with the strip, we get narrow strip and uh, white strip, and, and we do to get this mosaic. So this is, for example, another, so we see like here, we get this distortion in the back here, the streets and the cars and everything looks, looks normal. No distortion. Now, uh, this is through, if we just map the variance of the depth, and this is the curve that was found out, many times you see that the curve just bypasses the variances. Now, we don't see here the, the full cost. We don't see here the stitching cost. So, but just the way that it navigates around the high stitching costs. Now, when we look locally, like we did before, the images look right, there's no distortion. But if we try to go further and look at the entire block, so there is a, a side street here and another side street here, uh, what we see, we see that automatically what we get, we get, we don't get like one vanishing point for this line here, another vanishing point for it for these lines. So it's, now it's evident when you're zooming away that it's non-perspective. So when we look at this block, and we can see that we take this block, we see the left side, the right side from the right, and the left side from the left, and the front. So, so this block, and basically this block and each block will be seen uh, uh, through uh, this way. And and this happened automatically because the curve navigates. And basically, each block, it is like a cross slit where the slit is behind the block. Now, when we look locally in this image, it's normal. Locally, everything locally is normal. But when, only when we go far away, we see this kind of multi-perspective, obvious multi-perspective effect that we will, it will, I don't know if it does disturb me, but I do notice it. I'm not sure how, how much people from number of people will notice that a different uh, 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 hidden uh, lines. Okay, so uh, so this is now a mid mosaic of the street. Uh, again, this is like this half kilometer long street, and And now we can uh, we can just see the entire street, and if the if the regular mosaic, which was push broom, was obviously distorted, the depth difference uh, this one is is okay. And you see here the depth difference. You see use very wide strips, and uh, no depth difference here. Here, very narrow strip. So you play between narrow strip and white strip. The, the what difference here is, for example, this shade is closer, so wider strip. Anyway, so uh, if you're interested in a walk in Jerusalem, you can do it virtually. Okay, this is conclude the talk. Thank you. Of course. This is the main reason. Where is this car? You see? Actually, I'll this looks normal. Now, uh, it is normal because I'm made from very wide strips here, here, and there. Uh, I have the push broom version of this, and the car is <laughs> a toy car. Uh, now, now the, the trick is, here in Microsoft, it was done with objects. So do object, remove them, and paste them back. Uh, here, we don't need to separate anything. We just, the area, 
there is color, so we take white strip, and then here we take narrow strips to compensate for the white strip taken here, and again narrow strip. So take white, narrow, white, narrow, and uh, and and it's a stupid dynamic program that does it instantaneously, very fast. If you actually laid this out on top of the map, there wouldn't be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the strip and the map. That's all. It's always taking a full vertical strip, though. Yeah. Actually, we, we, we were, well, we didn't have time to do it. We thought about doing every row separately. But uh, we didn't do this because we didn't have the time. But then was all the, we, we can get shearing effect. Right. So I think, well, what do we do now? Now we got a short widening and uh, an O-ring. I think this is more terrible than, than, than shearing. Shearing is less. So uh, white, like in that doorway there, it kind of has this funny wave. Yeah. Here? Oh, that's an uh, error in the depth. Because we have this depth correction. So depth correction works most of the time because we take the strip and widen them. So when we have the wrong depth at some point, and especially here, we have, you, you see my car here on the reflecting window. So uh, it, because see the car, you can see the depth here. And so you think like this is infinite depth because it, it's not moving. So because that's... I'm reflected in the glass, so we think that this is infinite depth, and therefore it is distorted. So uh, that's trouble with all, all this reflecting surface, like glasses, especially glasses that reflect the camera. Why you get this curve? Yeah. So so when you stitch, you take uh, a, a wide. Uh, see, there is a wide strip here. It's a very wide strip because we thought there's. If you look here in depth difference, we get normal distance but then infinite distance so the the, the distance it took a wide strip when you have wide strip the effect of stretching the strip is is, is uh, obvious but this is a problem with all reflecting surfaces when take pictures of reflecting surfaces then uh, that's not that may be so it's not just taking vertical scan lines as is and adjusting the width of each one it's something in the so it's actually taking a strip and then widening it out. Yeah, yeah. Th this is what what we do. Uh, uh, let's so you essentially warp everything for a fixed depth, given your no, no. Estimate. This and is what we do with strip. We take each strip and we warp each strip based on the on the depth. So we do warp. Okay. So so we don't warp every point, but we take the strip and we warp right. it. So if then how do you assemble them? Hmm? And then how do they get reassembled? Then there's a, like a graph cut or something in there? No, 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 no. Just through this columns, is just copy columns. So no. The is you see, column. this is the mosaic. We stitch into the mosaic rectangles because this is how we stitch. Now, in order to know which, in from this image, so we know the left column go to the left column, what would be the right column? So we map this right column into the mosaic using the depth. And then we take this and, and, and we stretch it. So. Most of the time, it works well. Uh, when we have tremendous errors, like reflecting surfaces that you let us think that we have infinity, then uh, we get this kind of uh, bending. Yeah, but you will have a problem too if you have a very busy street where lots of people are walking around, then I would assume your depth estimation will be wrong. If you have a very busy street with many people walking around, there can be problems, yes. Well, in, there can be problem even more than that. Starting the problem, we assume that we compute the motion from the scene. So if the scene has many moving objects, how do you compute the motion from? So there's another paper that we did. How do you compute the motion when you take uh, from sea waves and crowd and this? So that's another trick. But it is interesting. And then comes, of course, the uh, in our case, we, don't, we assume that we interpreted motion as depth. So uh, when you interpret the motion as depth and you have a lot of moving objects, then you have a lot of depth. So this, of course, has to be taken into account and there's space for the more students to work on. So you'll have much easier life if you didn't have to go through computing depth, right? And do you really need the depth? How do you compute the motion of a camera without having some notion of depth? So there's you, you need, in order to do all this, you need the motion of the camera. And if you don't know the depth, 
in the good old days, you used to do mosaics without completing the motion, right? Yeah, but then it was fine when you did satellite imagery and everything was flat compared to the, the distance within the scene was flat. When your camera gets close to the scene and the scene starts to be three-dimensional, this doesn't work because in the same image you have region that work two pixels, region that move five pixels, fifteen pixels. What is the motion? So this is no so good old days that we started. You're right, but as we get closer to the scene and the scene got 3D and uh, we have to take this into account. Great, thanks.